Hello everyone, welcome to a new video. Today we will be talking about Kohlberg's theory of moral development. Okay, before we take a look at the different stages of moral development according to Lawrence Kohlberg, first let me show you the Heinz Dilemma. This is a situation that allows us to examine how you respond to, to different moral dilemmas, moral issues, and this will allow us to to know at which stage or level of moral development are you currently in right now, okay? So let me read the dilemma for you. So a woman is near death from cancer. A druggist has discovered a drug that doctors believe might save her. The druggist is charging $2,000 for a small dose, 10 times what the drug costs him to make. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, borrows from everyone he knows, but can scrape together only $1,000. He begs the druggist to sell him the drug for $1,000 or let him pay the rest later. The druggist refuses, saying, I discovered the drug and I'm going to make money from it. Heinz, desperate, breaks into the man's store and steals the drug. Should Heinz have done that? Why or why not? So this is your chance to pause the video reflect on the dilemma, and try answering the question if he should have done that or not. And try to give um, an, an explanation for your answer. And once you're done, you may play the video again, and let's see, let's examine your where you are right now in the different stages of moral development. Okay, so let's start with level one, or what we call free conventional morality, which is common among children. In this stage, children obey rules to avoid punishment or reap rewards, or they act out of self-interest. Particularly in stage one, which is under level one, this is what we call the punishment and obedience orientation. So children do good because they don't want to be punished. They do good so that they don't... Um, they do good so that they avoid punishment. Say, for example, why should why would they go to church, for example? Why would they lend their toys? That's because if they do not, they will be punished and, and they don't want that to happen to them. Okay, So their basis in determining what is moral, what is correct or incorrect, what is moral or immoral, is whether the behavior has been punished or not. So if a behavior is punished, then it is wrong. But if a behavior is unpunished, then it is correct. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay. However, one downside of those uh, one downside of such way of thinking is that a behavior that is not punished is not automatically correct. And a behavior that has been punished is not automatically wrong. Okay? So say, for example, what if you have been punished for doing something that is not incorrect in the first place? Okay, Or what if you were not punished even after doing something bad to other people? Like, for example, you had a fight with your classmate and then your mother told you, very good, or that's just right, he deserves it. Okay, so what I want you to think right now is that not everything that is not punished is correct. So, how does this? Um, how do people, particularly children in stage one, answer to the question? Should he, should Heinz um, have stolen the drug? They would say he should not steal the drug because that is bad, and he should not do anything that is bad. Okay. What about stage two? Instrumental purpose and exchange. Those who are in this stage do good to others or do moral behaviors because they want something in return. They consider what others can do for them. I should lend my crayons to my classmate because eventually he will repay me for my kindness. I would help my parent because if I do that, I will get a toy in return. 
So they, they act out of self-interest. They do something because they expect something in return. That's their, most kids do, um, they have that kind of motivation. Now, um, what would those in stage two say about the Heinz dilemma? They would say something like, he should do he should steal the drug because if he does that eventually his wife would have to repay him for his kindness or they may say that he should not steal it because if he if he stole the drug if he steals the drug he will be in jail and that would not be good for him so they act out of self interest what is the best for me or what can others do for me that's for the first two stages that's for the first level pre-conventional morality highly common among children what about level two so we have here conventional morality common among teenagers and some adults are still in this stage the uh, people in this stage are concerned about being good, they're concerned about pleasing others and maintaining social order. So in stage three, we have here the good boy, good girl orientation. They want to please others. They want to help others. They want to be good. And eventually, they want to do it. They want to be good for its own sake, not just to please others, but they have an image of what a good person should be. So if you ask them, why do you donate to the poor? Why do you go to church? Why do you do your assignment? Why do you help in cleaning the house? Their answer would be, because that's what a good person would do. This is something that made my parent happy, my teacher happy. So I'm going to keep on doing it. At first, it is anchored on what pleases others. Then eventually, as they, may, as they mature, they have an image of, what a good person about the what characterizes a good person so they will not do anything that will disappoint their parents their teachers okay however just like with the the, the previous two stages with the last two stages doing something that pleases others is not automatically correct okay and there are instances in which you have done something that disappointed someone else, but you know it's for the best. Okay? Because even parents, teachers, are also imperfect human beings. So they may, they may have something to say about your behavior, but maybe you know that it is not incorrect. You know that it's for the best in that situation. Now, going back to the Heinz dilemma, those in stage three would say Heinz should not steal the drug because that's not something a good person would do. That's something that only criminals would do. Or he may say that he should steal the drug because that's what a good husband will do. Something that will please the wife. Anyway, moving on to stage four, we have here law and order orientation. And in this stage, our definition of what is right is based on what is considered legal. Therefore, what is wrong is something that is illegal. So going back to the Heinz dilemma, they may say something like, Heinz should not steal because stealing is prohibited. That is bad. He would be, it's punishable by law. Okay. Regardless of any reason, stealing is bad. So that's something that would be said by someone in stage number four. However, the downside of stage number four is that what the law says, okay, that there's the law is not perfect. It also has its imperfection. It also has its shortcomings. So a certain action may be considered legal or illegal in a certain country. Okay? For example, that penalty may be considered legal in some countries, but is it moral? Is it okay to end somebody's life? Abortion may be considered illegal in some countries. 
having homosexual relations may be considered illegal, punishable by law in some countries. Okay. But is it automatically immoral? Okay. Is abortion automatically moral just because it is considered legal? So people in stage four follow what the law says, regardless of the circumstance, which is um, most um, people are in this stage, particularly those, and later we'll go back to this topic, those who are in non-Western societies are usually in stage four. Well, it's a good basis of what is right or wrong. No? The law is a good basis of morality of what is right and what is wrong, but there are more advanced stages. And we now take a look at level three or post-conventional morality. Okay, so it's not, morality is not always about obeying the law. Okay, we also have here stage five and stage six. So in level three, people recognize conflicts between moral standards and make their own judgments based on principles such as rights, fairness, and justice. In stage five, people think in rational terms, valuing the will of the majority and the welfare of the society. They think of the phrase, the greatest good for the greatest number. So for example, after a disaster, after a typhoon, people may choose to steal from convenience stores, from groceries, because they're hungry. Stealing may be considered illegal, but we know that everybody has the right to live. In some references, this stage is also known as stage five, social contract or individual rights or human rights. So it may be considered illegal, but everybody has the right to live. Or for example, Robin Hood, is uh, what he's doing is illegal by law, but what he's doing is it produces the greatest good for the greatest number. He steals money to help the poor. And some people, for some people, that is their definition of moral. If what I'm doing produces um, the greatest good for the greatest number, then this is considered moral, correct, ethical. Okay. So going back to the Heinz dilemma, okay, we can focus here on individual rights. They may say something like, Heinz should steal the drug because his wife has the right to live, even though stealing is um, illegal. He should do that because his wife has the right to live. You are allowed to steal from the convenience store if you are hungry because you have the right to live. Okay, Or they may say something like, Heinz should not steal it because the scientist has the right for fair compensation. Anyway, that's his discovery. So it's his right to charge $2,000. Moving on to stage six, the last stage, universal and ethical principles. And in this stage, we are now guided not by the law, okay, but instead not by what is pleasing to others, but instead we're guided by abstract principles such as rights, fairness, justice, maintenance of human life, equality, and so on. So for example, a person may say that even though that penalty is illegal in their country, he believes that some criminals should be punished by that penalty because that's his definition of justice. So in their society, that penalty is illegal. But for him, that's his definition of what is just. Or let's talk about um, fairness. Okay, Talking about fairness, for example, like what I mentioned earlier, like what I mentioned earlier, homosexual relationships may be considered illegal in some societies. But a person may say that if heterosexuals have the right to be happy, then the same should apply for those who are in a homosexual relationship. They also have the right to be happy and the society should be fair. Okay, Or some may put value on human life. For example, let's apply that to the, to the Heinz dilemma. 
Those in this stage may say that Heinz should steal the drug because human life is more important than anything else. It's more important than the value, okay? That's more important than the compensation of the scientists. People may also say that they are against abortion even though it's legal because everybody has the right to live. Or should I say maintenance of human life is more important than anything else. So that's for stage number six. Or another way, last example, they may say that Heinz should not be allowed to steal the drug because there may be others who are also in the same condition or who's also dying because of cancer. And they also have the right um, to live. Okay, so we, we are emphasizing equality in that example. Now, just to end this lecture, what's the common criticism against Kohlberg's theory? Well, it's very Western. Okay, those who are from non-Western societies usually score, um, are usually in the conventional instead of post-conventional level, which puts into question the cross-cultural validity, generalizability of this theory. Okay, for example, those from Eastern societies put, put more value on obeying authority, following authority figures, which is why we are most of us are in conventional instead of post-conventional. And other than that, his theory is somehow um, biased against women, not because women are, um, women usually score lower in terms of moral matu maturity, not because they are immature uh, in terms of morality, but instead, according to Gilligan, women put more value. What men value is different from what women value, whereas men value justice and fairness for women, what's more important is care and avoiding harm. So those are some of the common criticisms against Kohlberg's theory of morality. I hope that you learned a lot from this lecture, and I hope that you were able to understand how people at different stages differ in terms of moral reasoning. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. See you next time.